And sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anybody comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, wishing to construct a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlooker should laugh at him and say, this one began to build, but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king, marching into battle, would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any, any, one, any one of you who does not renounce all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. One of my favorite letters in all of scripture is Paul's letter to Philemon. Philemon is a prominent Christian and his slave Onesimus has run away and he's run straight to Paul who's in prison awaiting his execution. And Paul is writing Philemon to be merciful to Onesimus and tells him that he should not only not punish Onesimus for running off, he should welcome him back but not as a slave. Rather, he should welcome him back as his brother in Christ. In other words, Paul is telling Philemon to give Onesimus his freedom. And Philemon does it. We know he does it because Onesimus goes on to be a priest and then a first century bishop in the church. And we know that because we have one of his letters preserved, which is now in the office of readings of the Liturgy of the Hours, which all of the clergy pray daily. So right from the earliest days of the church, we see the church trying to educate people in social justice, which is basically treating everyone like brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, some will contest what I have just said with two objections. The first is that Paul in his letter to the Corinthians tells slaves to be content with their place and be obedient to their masters as if to Christ. True enough, Paul does say that. In his early letters, Paul was not overly concerned with affecting social change because he thought the second coming of Christ was going to happen in his own lifetime. So the theme of many of his early letters was simply strive for personal holiness. If, you're, if you've got un injustice happening to you, just put up with it. But strive for personal holiness so you're ready for the second coming when it comes because it's not going to be for long. As Paul gets closer to his execution, though, he begins to realize that the second coming of Christ may not be happening as soon as he expected. Then the tone of his letters shifts to the continuation of the church and social change. The second objection people will raise to my claim is that if Paul is against slavery in a letter contained in scripture, why did so many Christians partake of slavery for centuries afterwards? Good question. When Paul is writing this letter, about two-thirds of the people living in the Roman Empire were slaves. Although, after Paul writes this letter, Christians within the empire stop owning slaves. The Roman Empire collapses, slavery almost disappears. It doesn't quite go away, because then you've got the Middle Ages and the Crusades and bringing back Muslims as slaves and vice versa. So it doesn't disappear entirely, but it almost disappears, only to be resurrected again when Columbus returns from the New World. When Columbus went before King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, he brought back with him some Native Americans as slaves. Ferdinand was impressed. Ferdinand saw commercial opportunity here. Isabella was horrified. Queen Isabella wrote Pope Alexander VI, now, Alexander was no saint, not a nice guy at all. Alexander VI has no danger whatsoever of ever being canonized a saint. 
He was one of the Borgia Popes. This was probably one of the high points of corruption in the Catholic Church, where the Borgia family bought the papacy. For several generations, all the popes were members of the Borgia family, and they were very corrupt. Uh, Alexander VI himself had fathered several children while pope, uh, really not concerned with holiness. But to his credit, if he did one thing right, when, when Alexander gets this letter from Queen Isabella, he immediately issues a papal bull condemning slavery as a moral evil and forbidding Catholics from, part from partaking in slavery. Well, if that's the case, Father, why did so many Catholic nations participate in slavery for centuries after that, and the worst culprit was Catholic Spain, which was one of the last slave-holding countries in the world? Because not everybody listens to the church when we condemn something as a moral evil. Case in point. Is there anybody here who does not know that the Catholic Church condemns abortion as a moral evil? Did anybody here not know that? And yet, how many Catholics support abortions, have abortions, elect politicians who promote abortions? There you have it. History repeats itself. But that doesn't change the fact that since its apostolic foundations, the church has always tried to alleviate the burden of the oppressed and be a force for positive social change in the world. You may have heard by now that the diocese is having the Grateful for God's Providence Capital Campaign. This is a $50 million campaign to support our social ministries. Some of you have already gotten letters about the kickoff of the campaign and our time block. If you haven't gotten one yet, you will get one soon. Why is the diocese having a capital campaign now? First, our last capital campaign was the Vision of Hope 20 years ago, so we're due. Most nonprofits have a capital campaign every 15 to 20 years. Second, this campaign is going to be used to set up endowments to support our social ministries, seminary foundation, to care for our social priests, to support our Catholic schools, and a small percentage is going to replace the roof on the cathedral, which is over 100 years old. I think we got our money's worth out of the roof. These are the same things that the Catholic Charity Drive supports. But what this campaign is going to do is to ensure these programs continue into the next generation. Because let's face it, the church is shrinking, at least in this part of the country. If you get the Rhode Island Catholic, this past week's issue, published that the Catholic Church has, in Rhode Island has shrunk by 60% in the past 20 years. That's a huge number. This will allow the church to continue its ministerial work into the next generation. What's in it for us? Unlike the Vision of Hope campaign 20 years ago, which gave 20% of the funds raised back to the parish at the conclusion of the campaign, if the parish hit its goal, the Grateful for God's Providence campaign is offering 40% of the funds raised back to the parish from dollar one, whether we hit our goal or not. Folks, that's a good deal. The goal set for our parish is $431,141. The diocese is asking every family for a $3,000 pledge to be paid over four years. That's $62.50 a month, that's $2 a day. I have already given $10,000 of my own money to the drive because as with the Catholic Charity Drive, I will never ask you to do something I am not willing to do myself. With our share of the campaign money, $172,456, I will air condition the church. I thought after this past summer you would appreciate that. That's what's in it for us. You'll be hearing more about this drive here and there from now through October. My brothers and sisters, this drive is an opportunity for us to participate in the work of the church, to alleviate the burden of the oppressed and be a force for positive social change. So any assistance you can render is greatly appreciated. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.